Sun keeps rising. Days keep passing. World keeps spinning. Time, it just keeps moving forward. Weeks, months, even years go by. While you try to make sense of it all. Try to find where you belong. Try to look ahead to a better future. But the truth is, the path ahead has only grown darker. It's harder to see. You can feel so lost. So alone. So desperate for something. Anything that might show you the way. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I will be your Giving Monk for the evening. We've talked a lot about the apocalypse from various angles this month. Pre-apocalypse, post-apocalypse, non-contemporary genres, transhumanist variants, but in so many cases there's a single event or a series of events. This week I ask, why should we have only just one? To answer that, we'll be looking into Maximum Apocalypse from Rock Manor Games, an RPG adaptation of the board game of the same name with a few spins familiar and different. More importantly, despite some assumptions that it would focus on the typical zombie apocalypse, an understandable thing given the cover art, it has more interest in multiple possible apocalyptic events for players and game masters. Try saying that twice. In the interest of full disclosure, I will note that I backed this game personally and have interviewed the developers of the game. In addition, I will not be making any comparisons to the board game. I'm covering the RPG independent of all that. So how does it hold up? Let's find out. Maximum Apocalypse is split into three books. A core rulebook at 106 pages, a game master's guide at 110 pages, and a monster manual at 98 pages. It's remarkably easy to read through a very comic-like approach. There's also a smaller amount of fluff around world building, operating on the assumption that it's in a contemporary world pre-apocalypse, which certainly helps in that regard. That said, I don't care for the lack of an index. While this isn't as bad given the lightness of the books, I do have to maintain my policies. Rules are rules. Character creation in Maximum Apocalypse has an interesting worksheet-based approach. We'll be exploring this with a survivor named Kelvin Adama. Step 1 is base stats, the core line for all development for how things will increase or decrease with our choices. This magic number is 25. Step 2 is Primary Archetype, the class of sorts for characters. This will modify base stats positively and negatively. Now for this pick, we'll go with Ronin, giving a plus 15 to Strength, plus 10 to Fortitude, plus 5 to Instinct, and plus 20 to Fighting Skill, but a minus 10 to Ballistic Skill and a minus 5 to Luck. Step 3 is our Secondary Archetype. While it's possible to pick an archetype twice, we won't be doing so in this case, as our Secondary Archetype will be Veteran, granting a plus 5 to fortitude and a plus 10 to luck, and a minus 5 to intelligence. Step 4, Personal Apocalypse, is the world-ending event that's defined them. Now, unlike archetypes, Personal Apocalypses only confer positive modifiers to base stats. In our case, we'll go with Time Paradox, granting a plus 5 to intelligence and charisma, and a plus 10 to luck. Step 5 is Age, which can modify our base stats and add skill proficiencies. We'll be going with Middle Age, granting us two skill proficiencies, which we'll go with Blades and Firearms for. Step 6 is Free Development Points. Here we can spend 100 points on base stats on a 1 to 1 basis, with a cap of 35 to 1 stat. We'll go with 10 in Strength, 15 in Fortitude, 20 in Agility, 10 in Intelligence, 15 in Instinct, Fighting Skill, and Ballistic Skill. This makes our final stats as follows. Strength 50. Fortitude 55, Agility 45, Intelligence 35, Instinct 45, Charisma 30, Fighting Skill 60, Ballistic Skill 30, and Luck 40. This also makes our derived attributes to be Build 105, DC Modifier plus 1, Health Points 21, Initiative 8, Salvage 42, Resilience 77, Resolve 40, Immunity 47, and Dodge 45. Now, step 7 is combat skill proficiencies. There are 6 combat skills in total, and we gain proficiency in 2 of them. In our case, we'll be going with Brawl and Blades, bringing them one step further on the proficiency track. 
Step 8 is Archetype Skill Proficiencies. A primary and secondary archetypes grant proficiencies, 4 from the primary and 3 from the secondary. In our case, we'll go with Blades, Perception, Survival, and Tracking from the Ronin archetype, and Firearms, Survival, and Athletics from the Veteran archetype. Step 9 is Apocalypse Skill Proficiencies. We have a choice between two skills to be proficient in, and in this case we'll go with Charm. Step 10 is Special Abilities. We can choose two special abilities, one from Primary and one from Apocalypse. In our case, we'll go with Duelist and Displaced. Step 11 is Lucky Mutation, a benefit granted from a D10 roll to determine the effect. Now, in our case, we rolled a 5, which grants us Fleet-Footed. Lastly, Equipment. There are two methods towards equipment um, gaining. The first is the package-based bug-out method, and the second is the more free-form, free-choice method. We'll be going with the former and choose a kit piece for armor, weapon, and gear. In our case, we go with a Nomex Kevlar, a katana, two hatchets, a combat knife, a baseball bat, a camel tarp, two glow sticks, a military pack, running shoes, a pup tent, and four food units with 32 component pieces left over. Character creation is pretty straightforward despite all the steps. In fact, I'd say it's relatively easy to create characters quickly in this particular setup. But it's most important to note that there's going to be a fair amount of checking and rechecking because of the process, which is why the character worksheet is a godsend. The only thing I really had an issue with was the flow of the process, specifically the splitting between base stats and skills within archetypes entries in the book. Also, the use of symbols might throw off some at first. It's no doubt an artifact of the game's board gaming origins. It's a very old-school approach, to say the least. Maximum Apocalypse uses a percentile die system, rolling under a threshold to determine success or failure. Now, those familiar with games like Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay or the Warhammer 40k Roleplay series from Fantasy Flight will find some familiar ground here. In addition, rolling under half or a quarter of that threshold grants an additional degree of success. In other words, rolling under the threshold is one degree of success. Rolling under half is two degrees, and rolling under one-fourth is three degrees, while rolling under a natural one is four degrees. Furthermore, certain effects may grant advantage or disadvantage. This allows you to roll 3d10 and choose the higher or lower of the two, respectively, to act as the tens die. Advantage and disadvantage can stack up to three times. An additional stacking adds either a plus 5 to the threshold or a plus 1 to the required degree of success. Now, luck is the game's do-over resource instead of an extra effort, providing a re-roll for every 10 points in the luck stat. Combat works in a contested fashion, with attacking and defending being rolled by both sides. Damage is not necessarily tied to individual weapons, but by degrees of damage. These degrees range from light as a 1d4 to ruinous at a 2d10 plus 11. This makes for a high threat kind of combat since these health points are on the low end of the spectrum. Mechanically, Maximum Apocalypse is a fairly simple affair, but I can't say I'm the biggest fan of the use of symbols for certain mechanics as mentioned in character creation, especially for the use of component parts and enemy attraction. The enemy attraction thing is otherwise a very interesting idea. I get the intent but I feel they'd be better served in a game that uses symbol-based die like Genesis. In a strange way, Maximum Apocalypse reminds me of a retro clone. It's aimed to be simple and straightforward, which is why it tries to keep rulings to a few paragraphs per entry. The D100 system is arguably swingy, but that's going to be a mileage may vary kind of issue. More importantly, Maximum Apocalypse is interested in a very fill-in-the-blanks attitude with its world meaning it's going to rely on the players and GMs to be a bit genre-savvy to some extent. This is again why I call it a retro-clone game, and the lack of self-containment will likely make some approach with trepidation, since it doesn't have an established world like some other um, post-apocalyptic settings that we've gone over. Now, this is somewhat easier due to being the post-apocalypse, especially with the popularity of shows like The Walking Dead, but it's going to require that coordination between the whole table. I would argue that it might end up being a little too tempting to do the zombie apocalypse for the umpteenth time, which is kind of a waste of this game's potential. All that said, Maximum Apocalypse gets a stamp of recommended. 
There aren't many instances of a post-apocalyptic game that leans on beer and pretzels, but this is one instance of such. If you got started on games with referees instead of GMs, you'll be more at home here. Now, if you like diving into a detailed setting, I'd probably recommend you try out Mutant Year Zero instead of this.